Before we kick off, I'm sure most of you already know about ACAN and some are involved in the network, but for the benefit of others in the room, I will give a brief introduction into who we are and what we do. So for anyone new to ACAN, we are an open voluntary network of individuals in the built environment industry. Formed in 2019, it has now grown into a global network of over 3,000 people. It started with a vision for how we could work autonomously as a collective of individuals in order to make rapid decisions and respond quickly to the climate emergency. Our manifesto has three overarching aims, decarbonize now, ecological regeneration and cultural transformation. You can read a bit more detail about these here and on the ACAN website. ACAN is made up of many groups, including these nine main thematic groups of which natural materials is one. Each group is made up of individuals who want to make the change happen and a couple of people from each group take, on, take a coordination role to help facilitate the group and any actions. You can hear more about what else is going on in the other groups by joining ACAN and we'll share a link to the other groups in the chat box. I'll now introduce Tabitha who will be chairing this event. Tab Binding from Timber Development UK. Timber Develop TD UK provides information and support on all things timber, from seed to saw, from forest to furniture, from product to post occupancy evaluation. Tab leads on, the ed on education and engagement with a focus on future professionals across the UK who are studying any built environment subject by encouraging, infusing and educating on how to use timber widely and effectively. Tab is an active member of ACAN. Over to you, Tab. Thanks, Andy. Really appreciate it. I just to our you know, participants audience, aren't ACAN amazing? I mean, this is absolutely magnificent, this online, you know, group that's done so many good things. And I'm really honoured to be invited to chair tonight's webinar, having volunteered with ACAN across many of the thematic groups since 2019. And I've worked with, it with Timber for 37 years, cutting my teeth on Welsh softwoods and working almost exclusively with homegrown timber throughout my career. Trees and productive woodlands bring so many benefits and using more of it in long-lived products is so beneficial. UK grown timber to me is easy to produce, easy to specify and easy to use. And our speakers tonight will explain how they have done that themselves. So I'm delighted to introduce Kath Giles from Evolving Forests, who I got to meet in person only the other day down in Hereford at Enmite. Kath is currently studying in a master's in green building at the Centre for Alternative Technology. Um, she has over 10 years experience in sustainability and a background in horticulture, having studied at the Schumacher College. Kath, would you like to take over and uh, share screen? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Tabitha. I'm just going to seamlessly share my screen. And there we go. Okay, great. Brilliant. Thumbs up from Tab. Thank you so much, Tab. And thank you, ACAN, and everything that, that you're doing as a group. I've been uh, lurking in the background for some time now. So such an honour to come along and have an opportunity to, to share some of the work that we've been doing and, and to join the conversation, uh, Growing Timber and everything that sits around that. So a little very, very potted uh, background for, for, for ourselves. So I'm part of an organisation called Evolving Forests based down in Devon. And we operate in this very unique space where we have a foot very much in forestry and connected with timber growers and producers and uh, everything that sits around the woodland management of that side of things, whilst at the same time having a foot very much in the realm of architecture uh, with the work that Jez, my colleague, does with the uh, previously with the Architectural Association and ongoing work with various architect schools across the UK and further afield and my interest and speciality increasingly more in the built environment. So we operate in this muddy space between the two which is just such a fascinating niche to be a part of and so we've come along today to talk very much about you know growing timber in the UK but not so much about the the technicality of that and what that means to be growing trees um, directly but more about what the landscape of growing timber is currently and, and what that might be in the future and how rapidly that might change and where it's heading. So we're kicking things off here. For anyone who 
isn't instantly familiar with this. Uh, this is a scene from the book The Lorax by Dr. Zeus, um, some 50 years old now, I think, or thereabouts. And the prescient message of this book is still so relevant and so powerful and is such a perfect demonstration of where we've been in the last 40, 50 years or so of timber production. That sort of traditional monoculture plantation idea that most everyone will have when maybe you think of forestry if you're not deeply connected to what's going on there that's very much um, the scenes that you'll be familiar with um, and and that's come about from from this need to to supply a demand that's coming through and actually if we think about the current ecological crises um, and that growing appetite for bio-based materials and for timber structures. We need to think about where this timber is coming from and how it's being grown and, and how that all fits with the climate and where that's all heading. So bear with me on this slide. There's a lot going on there that you don't really need to uh, get your head around too much, but this is from the um, ecological site condition tool uh, that the that forest research use. Um, fascinating way to waste hours <laughs> if you have them. But you yeah, here we're looking at, we've done this for Devon. So our muggy, miserly, warm, dank climate. These are just an example of a few species that are very, very happy growing in the conditions that we see at the moment. Um, but if we skip on, and we mess with that tool and we play with the modeling and we put in predictions of what the climate might be for say 80 years time, that really significantly changes what we could be growing. Um, and, and, it, and that has an impact on what we might be putting in the ground now and what we, you know, what we think about what our future species might be. And then beyond that, we then come to again, Another slide that actually you don't need to worry too much about everything that sits around this. Again, that could be a whole episode in itself. But really what we're looking at here is something that's only going to serve to compound the changes in the climate and how that's reacting with the species that we can grow and the timber that is available. Because this is forest researchers predictions um, for timber availability. And if you look at the next 15 years, things seem to be OK, but there is going to be a significant drop off of material that is available and you pull all that together with the changing climate. We haven't even mentioned pests and diseases yet. That's again, a whole nother thing that's gonna have a massive impact on the crops that we're growing. And if we're growing in monocultural terms, again, that impact is amplified. So it all paints a bit of a, a heady <laughs> mix. And at this point, I'm conscious that we're slight doom and gloom. And then I think, well, you know, <sighs> we can look backwards and so this map is just an example of some some complex ways some complex systems that may have existed previously um, that look towards resilience and when we think about how we might grow timber and, and what timber and what species we might grow but it's not only about looking back we have so much technology available to us and that's only growing more and more and this image overlaid now as an example of the kind of scanning technology that can be used to help enhance and support and you know create more resilient woodland and woodland management so maybe it's more that it's a combination of these two things of looking back at complex silver culture and complex systems that can lead to more resilient timber production but combining that with the technologies that are coming through to really support those and all of that comes comes together to to paint a picture of actually more complex diverse silver culture going forward it's changing so so rapidly and actually thinking about the complexity of of the timbers that we will have available to us within the built environment that then starts pulling together these worlds i said at the start of forestry and of that that built environment and of architecture and that traditionally these worlds in a very general way have been so separate but actually more and more these two spaces need to be operating in that middle space and forging new paths and working through this collaborative iterative process to find out how we can use timbers best for the properties that they're presenting 
rather than maybe just throwing down a specification and, and potentially even over specifying, you know, that can happen so, so easily. But we can all learn so much from each other. And it feels like, although I've dragged you through quite a doom and gloom entry, actually, this to us is such an exciting, interesting and brilliant opportunity and space to be working in and to be creating in together and offers so much possibility for uses of timber we haven't considered yet and products that we can't even think of at this point. So I guess overall, it is a very simple message of complexity and that that isn't a negative thing. That's an exciting adventure that, yeah, we can't wait to get stuck into. So I will wrap it up there, but it, it, it's so difficult to cover so much that we want to talk about in the five to 10 minutes I was allowed. So we're wide open for any, any further conversations always, you know, please don't hesitate to give us a shout and I will quit rambling and sign out there. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Kath. That was absolutely brilliant. If you've got any questions for Kath, please put them in the chat and we will come to them at the end. I'd now like to hand over to Tom Barnes of Baston Timber. Tom, it's good to see you down in London on uh, Wednesday. I think I've seen all the speakers quite recently. <laughs> so, Baston Timber manufacture oak beams, timber cladding and hardwood flooring. They specialise in British grown timbers, including English oak, sweet chestnut, ash, sycamore and larch. And Baston is the largest hardwood sawmilling company in the UK and it's their mission to encourage more use of British timber. In 2016, Baston launched Brimstone, an innovative range of thermally modified British timber that offers a sustainable and economical alternative to imported hardwoods. And I'm really pleased that somebody brought that together and Tom I think you installed your plant at the beginning. Uh, end of last year, yes we did, we did. Right. The floor is yours. So can I first of all say to Catherine, well done for introducing the Lorax, one of our, my family's favourite books. Um, right, let me share my screen. Okay, so thank you for the introduction, Tabitha. Yep, my name is uh, Tom Barnes. Um, I am I'm fourth generation owner and the current managing director of Baston Timber. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you today about um, something that has been my baby for the last um, seven years now, uh, which is, is a product that we've called Brimstone. Um, but it's a project, it originated really from, from collaboration. Uh, throughout the industry and various organizations and it and it came about I suppose as a solution to a problem and the problem was that much of the the wood that we have growing in our woodlands uh, is not deemed to be desirable by the industry or um, other manufacturing um, we obviously in this country used to have quite a quite a busy furniture making industry um, that's gone really um, we used to make things like matchsticks once upon a time we no longer do that so there's lots of species growing in our woodlands that don't have a use and therefore they don't have value and that means that woodland owners can't sell them which means they don't have the money coming in to do the management of the conservation work and the replanting that we want them to do so the problem was how do we get how do we give value to these timber species and that really is where brimstone came from so what's going on here oh, here we are right um yeah so brimstone is a modified timber um and on the screen here i've just just a very quick introduction to what modified wood is um, I've put up a few brand names there, some I'm sure you'll recognize, such as the Koya, maybe Kebony, probably Thermo Wood. Um, these are all examples of modified wood. Uh, and there's two kind of broad categories of modified wood. One is impregnation, and that is, um, a Koya is, a, is the most popular, sort of um, well-known example of that. And they use a process called acetylation, where they are impregnating some called, something called um, acetic anhydride. Kebony is another example of that. Um, the other broad category is thermal modification. 
where you use intense heat to change the structure of wood. Um, and when we talk about modifying wood, it's very different to just the chemical treatment of wood. So the old sort of style of CCA treatment or green treatment of timber, where you're trying to force a chemical in to stop the bugs and nasties from eating the wood. That's not the same thing. Modifying wood is actually when you are changing the cell structure of the wood all the way through the piece of wood and it's permanent change. And what you're trying to do basically is, is um, enhance particular desirable properties. And often what, what you're looking at is actually the relationship between water and wood, because we know they're not the best bedfellows. Um, and if we can change that relationship, we can do two main things. One is to make the wood more stable. So it's not getting wet and dry and expanding and contracting and doing all the things you don't like wood doing as architects. And also you can enhance the durability because when wood, um, when, the, when the moisture content of wood rises above a certain level, then the fungi gets to work and starts rotting it. So if you can actually control that and keep that moisture level lower, then the fungi don't get to work. So you, you end up with the, the, the benefits of, of greater stability and greater durability. So that's what modified wood is. Um, I suppose the next question is, is why modified wood? Um, why bother? Why, what, what's the fuss? Well, we all, we're, I guess we're here today, partly because we want to use more wood in construction. Um, Catherine pointed out, had a little graph there for the UK showing that actually the availability of wood excuse me, in this country is going to drop off um, after a, a decade or two. Globally, um, the predictions are that the surface area of buildings is going to double by 2050. Uh, consumption of wood uh, is predicted to triple. The trouble is trees aren't going to speed up for us, uh, and particularly slow-growing trees. And there's quite a few wood species that we have used in the past, and we still use now, that take many hundreds of years to grow. Um, some tropical species, even species like Canadian cedar, can be up to 400 years old. You know, an oak tree that I could just about get my arms around would be 200 years old. And it doesn't matter how you define the word sustainable, if we want to use more wood in the future, it is not sustainable. We cannot sustain the use of wood that takes hundreds of years to grow. But often fast growing woods don't have the properties we want. They tend to be soft, they tend to be less stable, they tend to be non-durable, not in all cases, but in many cases. So what if we could take a tree that has taken 40, 50, 60 years to grow, and we could make the wood from it behave like that that has taken two, three, four hundred years to grow without using any noxious chemicals? And that'd be pretty cool. And that's what modified wood is all about. Um, and so what are the drivers? Well, the drivers are we want to use more wood. So we're going to have to use quicker grown wood and we're going to have to do clever things to it to make it behave in the way we want it to behave. Um, under European chemical regulations, we can't use the, uh, the highly toxic chemicals we used to use. They work very well. Creosote, CCA, arsenic, all works well, but it's not great for kids. And we're not allowed to use it anymore. So we have to find smarter ways to treat the wood. So that brings me on to um, Brimstone. Um, we decided to go down the route of thermal modification. And one of the main reasons we decided to do that is because uh, you, can, you can pretty much thermally modify any wood. Some species work better than others. But whereas with impregnation modification, you can only really use a very limited number of species. And the most popular one is radiata pine. And where it's grown in the way, in, 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 the, in the sort of uh, to high quality that, that most companies want um, is New Zealand. So we're already bringing the wood halfway around the world before we use it. The great thing about thermal modification is that we can use locally grown wood. And I've been all over Europe um, looking at plants that are just modifying the wood that is locally grown. So it made perfect sense to, to, to think about thermally modifying the wood that grows in this country. Um, the picture there, that, what, what you're looking at there is actually thermally modified poplar, so it's the brimstone poplar. Um, again, a tree that's got very few uses, but once modified, the, the wood is fantastic. 
Uh, this is our plant here, I'm proud to say. It's the first one in the country and that landed here in January. Um, it's a relatively small plant. Uh, we can do about a thousand cubic meters a year, uh, which is equivalent of about 30,000 square meters of cladding. Uh, but we do have plans to put another one in. I kind of wish I'd put a bigger one in now, but you know, hindsight's a great thing, isn't it? Uh, but that is, I think, yeah, that's some poplar that has that is on its way out, having been modified. Um, and again, in terms of what we're actually trying to do here, um, number one, we're trying to use locally grown timber from mostly from England, um, some from Wales, that's about as far afield as we go. That's our aim in life, is to use locally grown timber. And, and if, certainly under brimstone, nothing gets used that is not grown in this country. Um, we are trying to improve the durability. Uh, the species we use are ash, poplar, sycamore at the moment. Uh, they're all non-durable species, meaning if you use them outside, they would rot very quickly. By thermally modifying them, we can get them up to class one durability, which is as high as you go with a piece of wood. The only caveat to that, though, is you can't stick it in the ground. That is for above ground use. Um, stability, a vast improvement on stability, between 50 and 60% improvement on stability, meaning that the wood will stay flatter, it will stay truer, the dimension, dimensional size will stay much closer to the original size. Um, and that, again, is, is down to the moisture, because the actual moisture content of this wood, once modified, is about 4 to 6%. Now, you'll probably know that wood certainly left outside, will equalise at somewhere between 16 and 20%. So it's very, very dry. And because of the change, the, the, the change in the cell wall, which I haven't got time to go into now, but essentially the water can't bond onto the piece of wood. Um, no chemicals are used to enhance the durability. And also um, the extractives, and by that I mean kind of oils and cedar and tannins and things, and they're largely burnt away. Um, and, and all we're using is heat. The heat, by incidentally, is about 212 degrees we go up to. Uh, now, our vision, when I say local, um, <clears throat> what I'm talking about is, is 100 miles. Um, so we try and do everything within 100 miles. We try and buy all of our trees within 100 miles and try and sell to projects within 100 miles. Now, if you ask me really nicely, and you're a bit further away, we'll probably sell you the wood because we're kind like that. Uh, but we think there's enough, there's enough business for us in that area and there are enough trees for us. And we've got no interest in trying to import wood from further afield, no interest in trying to export it and sell it in America or further afield in Europe. Because I think, for me, certainly, um, the essence of sustainability, and it's a really, you know, it's, it, it's a dangerous word to be using, but... I think there has to be an element of localism in there and there has to be scale. And scaling a plant like ours to fit in with the availability of raw materials around us, I think is really important. And I think building a massive great plant here and having to import wood from all over the, all over the world to fill it uh, is completely nuts. Uh, so this picture here is of some brimstone ash cladding um and and it's, it's a very nice it's a very nice project um most of the vast majority of the brimstone at the moment is going into cladding um that recently has been driven by the fact that um the sort of staples of the cladding market siberian larch being one is now basically illegal um that was a big chunk of the market and canadian cedar was another big chunk of the market and that's now horrendously expensive so kind of both of them are both off the menu and it, has, and it has prompted many of your colleagues to contact us and say, you know, we've specified Siberian larch or Canadian cedar, what can we use? And we take great pleasure in saying, well, how about you use something that's grown just down the road? Um, you, don't have, you don't have to sacrifice anything. It's gonna be cheaper for you. Uh, functionally, it's gonna be as good, if not better. So what is not to like? Uh, very quickly, uh, we did an EPD a few years ago for the brimstone. Um, having gone through the EPD process, I realised the sort of numbers out at the end are, you know, they're mildly interesting, um, quite difficult to compare. A lot of work needs to be done in EPDs. Um, originally, um, before we had the plant here, we were taking the material to France to have it modified and bringing it back. 
So um, the EPD, when it is renewed next year, I think, will look a whole lot better. Um, one thing that, that um, I should mention, and the thing I don't like about EPDs with wood on the whole, is that what tends to be done is that the, the, the fossil-based carbon emissions and the sequestered carbon are kind of mushed together. And then you get this lovely negative figure at the bottom that looks fantastic. Um, I personally don't like that way of displaying it. And I think it's important to acknowledge the biogenic carbon that is sequestered. It's also important to acknowledge that at the end of its life, it's all gone and you're back to neutral again. Um, unless obviously it goes into another product, but more often than not, it's gonna get burnt and therefore that biogenic benefit is lost. So I think it's really important to focus on the, the naughty side, the bad side of emissions and be honest about them. And I think that for me is absolutely key in this whole conversation is honesty. Be honest about what the bad impact of making your product is. And so I think we were one of the first companies actually to split out the biogenic carbon and the fossil-based carbon in the EPD and just put the fossil-based carbon there front and centre and say, look, this is the impact. And the story is, how can we reduce it? And that is what we're doing at the moment. Um, obviously, by bringing, bringing all the manufacturing on site is, has certainly helped that a lot. We are trying our absolute best to run this plant on renewables, but it seems that everything is standing in my way from doing it. So we are hoping for the end of the year um, but I think, you know, nothing's easy in life, is it? And this certainly isn't. But that's our aim, to be running purely on renewables um, by the end of the year, if not maybe a little bit into next year. Um, again, you know, we're looking at sequestered carbon. It's obviously, it is important to, um, to, to consider the idea that um, wood is a carbon store. Um, but for that to be a valid argument, that wood has got to be in use for a long time. It's not really a valid argument if the wood is going for biomass or into a very short term use like animal bedding or even fencing that barely lasts more than five years, I don't think. But I think, you know, if we can, if we can again do cool things to wood that make that wood last a whole lot longer. And in this case, you know, the brimstone life cycle is that the tree takes about 50 years to grow <clears throat> and the product should last, last about 50 years in service. Um, that is a whole lot better than what is happening to most of the ash that is now being taken down for um, the reasons of ash dieback, which is all going for biomass and being burnt. So um, that's our mission in life, um, to keep that wood in use for as long as possible. That's me done. Um, Thanks so much, Tom. It's a bit of a whistle-stop tour, but we do offer a CPD on this. If you want to get down into the, you know, the deep, dark science of it all, then please do contact me. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. If you can stop sharing, I will then introduce um, Matt Stevenson from Ecosystems Technologies, who are an innovative prop tech company led by experienced sector professionals and dedicated to digital transformation in the construction industry, applying innovation in timber technology and the democratization of sustainable, healthy building solutions. God, Matt, you have so many long, difficult words in here. Founder Matt is a recognized industry leader in digital tool construction technology and low carbon building designs, having previously founded and developed early industry pioneer carbon dynamics. And on a personal note, Matt works crazy hours and he makes the rest of us work crazy hours too. So thankfully he's not up on a roof somewhere and I'm not stuck in a building. <laughs> Matt, over to you. Oh, thanks, Tabitha. And, and, and it's good you got all those long words out. I don't have to uh, repeat those in the presentation. So thanks for that. Uh, great to join this discussion. Uh, let me see. Yeah, uh, that's working. Uh, look, I'm going to try and cram too many slides into the time I've got, but I'll do my best and I'll start the uh, clock now. So, um, so Ecosystems Technology founded the company to accelerate our transition to a carbon negative build, build environment. Uh, we, we're here to demonstrate the value of timber-based off-site manufacture through applied innovation uh, to cultivate an ecosystem of sustainable building practices through open collaboration, to transform construction methodologies through the adoption of holistic systems thinking, and to accelerate the commercialization of homegrown build systems. And through that, do that old democratization of access to sustainable, healthy, low energy buildings and solutions. Right, that's that uh, mouthful out of the way. So um, fundamentally, we design and manufacture amazing timber buildings, hopefully. 
Um, I want to talk a little bit about the collaborative approach that uh, that, that underpins that. So uh, we work really really effectively with uh, with uh, academia, uh, with industry partners, and uh, and with innovation centres. So here on this this slide, you can see uh, um, you can see uh, what I should have updated it's CSIC, but what is now best. Uh, they they bring that the innovation side of things, connected ecosystems, the the innovation factory, and all everything that comes with that. Um, serial collaborators with them and with Edinburgh Napier University and the team there who've done all of these research that underpins from a technical sort of knowledge base uh, the, the the use of the timber and going forwards the the testing uh, you know structural and acoustic and all, all the different forms of testing along with that the University of Edinburgh on the fire testing side of things uh, more recently collaborating with Enmite, you know, looking at that education piece, how do we get, you know, that next generation uh, coming through um, all of this, uh, the, the work that we do, uh, we, we, we position ourselves as commercial accelerator, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, um, that work that we do never leverages that network effect, all of these, uh, all of these it, in, all these partners who, who have vested interest in in, in this uh, theme of work doing well, and then we've got early adopters, customers, folk who give us license to, to try this stuff early. Um, so we've got this uh, product development methodology uh, sort of, uh, roadmap. So how do we how do we go from forest floor to finished finish product and finished building? Um, what you can see here is some slides down the side where uh, we, uh, we we've we've so the uh, topic of, the, of my talk is about sort of breaking the the barriers, but the barriers have predominantly been about perception. Perception that the uh, our homegrown UK and and specifically what we're working with Scottish timber isn't going to be suitable um, for engineered timber. That it's going to not will not get sufficient yields. That will that it'll twist or bend. All of all all of these all of these perception barriers. Well, you know we've con confronted those head on, and you do that by through collaboration. So we uh, we've collaborated with uh, Dave Mills and. The, his team at Botergart and Sawmill, who brought the the timber drying expertise, knowledge. You know, how do you how do you at commercial scale demonstrate that we can we can do this? So you can see kiln loads. That's first kiln load of timber there, 150 cubic meters, going through the grading and in, into the product, through the vacuum press, through into finished product. Um, and you know what? You very quickly can demonstrate that that that, that product suitable from 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 the get go. So the very first panels became panels in in one of our demonstrators. Um, so we're looking to move that homegrown homegrown product up the value chain. We're looking to do that and add that value. We need to understand it through these the five capitals approach of physical, natural, social, human, and financial, and those drivers that should affect the industry but often don't. I'm going to move forward because I'm going to run out of time, but the you know, we're transforming homegrown timber into engineered products. We're then using those engineered products within our building components, which become constituent elements of our build systems. And all of that feeds out to deliver uh, tangible projects. So about our commercial accelerator model, you know, we, we're trying to be there to do the applied innovation. How do we get, how do we, how do we accelerate that forward? We haven't got time to wait around, have we? We've got to, you know, deal with the climate emergency. So it needs speed and impetus. So um, so we move rapidly through from concept and technical design all the way through to finished products. And I'll, I'll show you that uh, sort of manifest through a couple of case studies. So um, we had uh, funding from Scottish Government through Transport Scotland and in turn through BEST um, to deliver uh, a concept design for uh, replicable kit of parts to, to, to either retrofit or new build um, new office hubs to, to create 20 minute workspaces as we came out of COVID. We very quickly went to prototyping, developed a digital toolkit, a configurator tool that can allow, allow that to be adopted at scale into full scale prototypes, both new build at the top there and, and retrofit of our own office down below. And then that quickly, you know, you end up with clients like Scottish Power who have the aspiration to deliver uh, zero carbon uh, builds and 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 actually time constraints on delivery. And we're, we're able to put ourselves under staff pressure to deliver at pace. And that that allows us to move the dial forward. So we now have, you know, in both both new build and retrofit solutions, stuff that can be scaled and that can have significant uh, impact into the market and various applications for that. Uh, we've been privileged to be involved in UK government's Department for Education's Gen Zero project. So 
bit this is building on the back of innovate uk funded you know sort of four million pounds worth of technical development of a zero carbon build system of course that has to be timber what we've been able to do is enshrine that that could be uh, homegrown timber and uh, that was manifest through early prototype in which we delivered for cop 26 alongside about uh, 16 other projects because we're gluttons for punishment but uh, you know it's that that platform became platform for 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 um really sealing the deal around how valuable that could be uh, for the for the future of school building in the UK. So, we've gone from early prototype that that the, the image at the bottom is uh, is that prototype now at Enmite. It was at, at best during COP twenty six. Now done on site uh, delivery of a project for MTC uh, in Coventry, and that and between now and the end of March, we'll be delivering three follow on projects uh, with that, and hopefully a school for uh, Fawcett School in Cambridge in collaboration with Cambridge Uni. I won't go through this slide, uh, but you know, there's been it's been a hell of a journey. COP26 was sort of a really good sort of, uh, milestone there. We're a year ahead. Hopefully, we've moved forward. I'm not sure how much of uh, uh, COP intent has uh, moved forward in that time, but hopefully, uh, uh, hopefully, we'll see more progress. Um, so look, I'll, I'll I'll run you through you know what that looks like in terms of projects rolled out and delivered to site because you know this 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 innovation prototyping is great piloting piloting is great but it needs impact so it needs to it needs to be demonstrably sort of delivered out into the marketplace so we were delighted to deliver the, uh, August last year a project for Fettis College in uh, Edinburgh six study rooms this is all our own homegrown mass timber so CLT in the walls glue lam panels in the floor and nail our nail lam laminated product in the ceilings uh, we did a, 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 an extension for uh, Professor Robert Hairston, who's done so much of the early sort of work in, and his team doing so much of the work in sort of demonstrating the homegrown uh, resource and its suitability viability. So great to deliver one of the early projects uh, for him, and that also is uh, a route route to future sort of retrofit and and, and sort of smaller scale extension type projects. Um, our sister company. Uh, off-grid travel uh, we've designed and manufactured uh, these couple of uh, off-grid uh, units for them that's hopefully a scaling proposition uh, with lots coming to wilderness uh, locations soon um, for COP26 we did this uh, synergy demonstrator so two two bed two story demonstrator and um, those were the first panels in in the walls that we that we produced with the first homegrown timber you know so great to demonstrate for, right out the gate that that's 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 doable you can see bottom left that's intended as part of a, a terrace of units and you know uh, again it's important that these are, are are positioned in terms of their the the scope for for scaling these propositions um, Gen Zero. Um, so you can see top left, you know, that's that scaling sort of potential. So the, the 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 classroom scale prototype, which we did, it would would be one of the multiple classrooms within that um, within that uh, classroom part of the build. Uh, further towards the bottom of that uh, that image you've got the the hall the halls so um so the follow-on project to that being the gen zero sandpit at mtc so you can see here with pre-manufacturing in our factories enhanced products uh, with all all of the insulation layers and of course of course it's wood fiber insulation cork insulation in the roof in the roof as well um i know cork uh, there was great uh, presentation recently on, on on cork on this uh, forum so um Everything, all the external cladding pre-insulated, so so really it's just an assembly on site and that enhanced uh, value uh, created in full. Near home retrofit, so you can see componentry, kit apart, replicable, scalable, reconfigurable, uh, all all sort of delivered through a, a kit apart configurator that you know means that it can be easily specified. That then pivoting into a either the retrofit or the new build. So this is a prototype demonstrator for new build. Uh, and then you know we've got we're, we're really fortunate to have these early adopter clients you know who, who've got that intent got that aspiration to deliver zero carbon build so uh, this Scottish power training training unit uh, was was delivered earlier this year uh, and makes for you know fantastic you know biogenic uh, training space and so in conclusion you know uh, all of that is is it, it, you know creates this flywheel hopefully of, of of constant innovation applied innovation but then that spin out and commercial commercialization that allows us to keep expanding those collaborations strengthening impacts expand you know uh, incubating and accelerating bringing forward the next generation all of that really exciting stuff so i think i've gone just over my 10 minutes but i hope that's okay and thanks for the opportunity 
Thanks, Matt. Um, I'll hand straight over to Neil. So Neil Sutherland from Macar is an architect-led design, manufacturing and construction company established way back in 2002. And Macar exists to design and deliver healthy, comfortable, beautiful, low energy homes using only environmental friendly building materials, including Scottish grown timber. Mac will use innovative off-site construction methods, which, given the significant and tangible environmental benefits, are now wide, widely recognised as the future of new housing. Neil. Thanks very much, Tabitha. That's, uh, that's very kind. Um, and I'll just get this up. OK, right, I'll try and run through this. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. So, uh, yeah, Mac, we're based in the north of Scotland. We've been around for a while. And I've been working in this space for about 30 years. Uh, so we exist because we build, we believe great buildings and places enhance people's lives. Uh, what is going on with this? Uh, somehow I'm not being able to. Uh, here we go. Okay, can you see that? Is that okay, Tabitha? So what we've done in many respects is, is look at the resource that we have. I'm gonna talk mainly about softwood use. Um, and we up in the north here, we have um, we have four commercial species. I'm going to speak about that in a minute. But what we've done really is to is to appreciate the resource that we have and respond to that, because uh, there's no point lamenting the fact that we don't have certain species or the species isn't good enough and this type of thing. In actual fact, we have some extraordinary opportunities with timber, and the UK Britain's a fantastic place to grow trees. As we've heard from Kath and from Tom, uh, here's a couple of, of images I got from uh, Andy Leach at Confort. Thanks, Andy. I think he's on the call, actually. And this just sort of demonstrates uh, where we are contextually with Europe. So you can see the average uh, forest cover, some quite surprising numbers there for, for most people, actually, in Central Europe, you know, France, Germany, up at over 30% timber cover, where the, the UK is, is, is fairly dismal, although it's a growing, it's a de developing, expanding situation. So in Scotland, um, that's the, the area I know most about, we were down at two, 3% in a hundred years ago. Now we're up at just below 20% and, and it's increasing, but we're, we've still got a long way to go. You can see in the, the, the right-hand image there, that kind of uh, the split between conifer and, and deciduous uh, forestry. England, it's, it's roughly exactly the opposite of Scotland in terms of, of far more hardwoods. So I'm, I'm glad that Tom's responding to that and we're responding to, uh, to the conifers. And this is a very interesting slide I got from Andy as well. So this shows the split in species. And if nothing else, it shows how, how vast the kind of range of, of species that we can actually grow successfully here at the moment. And like, like Kath, I believe, I'm gonna talk about commercial softwoods, but I believe that the best forestry is a mixed forestry. Monocultures are never a good idea. So timber and timber products, so four commercial species, complementary in characteristics. So we've got the pines, the spruces, the firs, and the larches, and we have a few other things as well, such as hemlock, cedar, whatever. Um, the, what we try to do, we're, we're an ecological specification company. We're, the, the, the key to it, as, as Tom mentioned, is moisture content. You have to actually understand how timber works with, with moisture. And interestingly enough, the, the, the commercial species, this is unique really to, to the UK because of our, our history of deforestation and then, then rapid sort of um, regrowth in a sense. But we, we have a range of species that are really, really good for, for building houses particularly. So we can use the different species for different, um, for, for different purposes. I was asked to say something about specification. Uh, so, so just very rapidly, um, some of you will know that, that the, the kind of classifications is, is kind of based on, on a mixture of strength, um, stiffness and density. I always have to remind myself of that. The, um, and, and, and in Scotland, for example, across the UK, probably there's particular characteristics that lend, it, lend themselves to, to different applications. In engineering terms, very often, uh, we're talking about the, 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 the C classes, so C16 all the way through to C30, C16 being a lower classification and the higher number, the better. The, if there's one thing you can take from my presentation is if you specify C, C24 timber, it tends to be imported, okay? 
pretty much all the all the all the uh, sawmills uh, machine grade to C16, even though the the grade is actually very often higher than that. So in terms of the the products groupings that we we regard, so we have large section structural such as the Douglas fir behind in the, in the image, carcassing framing timber. They, these tend to be the spruces and the pines. Then we've got external finishes tends to be the larches, and internal finishes can be anything, including hardwoods, and the composite boards and the engineered products that that Matt's just mentioned. It's worth kind of mentioning that the development of timber products kind of mirrors the, the, the process use as well. So that image shows some Daulam in Switzerland. If you ask the Swiss where they get the timber, they sort of look at you in a funny way and say, well, from the sawmill down the road, where would you get it from? You know, in the UK, we're so used to pulling in timber from across the world. These guys respond to the resource that they have. So Mac has an offsite construction company. The future for housing is, is, is a manufacturer model. You can do everything with 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 timber in that sense. The the kind of um, the, the the gaps that we have in terms in terms of the local supply chain uh, relate really to those sophisticated materials that the engineered products and the insulation products, the cellulose and that type of thing. And I'm really keen on modification, Tom. That's really good. But uh, <laughs> again, you know, we're trying to do stuff in terms of what we have up here, and hopefully we'll get more more companies doing this kind of kind of work that Tom's doing and that the whole area can can expand you know timber we're in we're living in the age of timber we just don't necessarily know it other important things are are, are technical innovations such as the fixings tapes and glues and this type of thing that have come across come around in recent times allow us to do some amazing things so there's a, a bunch of of, of uh, pre-assembled panels heading down the road that image shows probably three different species Douglas uh, sick uh, spruce and, and larch. So as assembly processes. I want to say something about passive house because uh, we've built a number of certified passive houses. This is Guinness Shin, this is a project just outside Inverness. And we, we basically took our, our standard um, panel system made up of rigid um, loose fiber, rigid uh, wood fiber board, uh, loose fiber, and 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 particle boards and solid timber, and we actually we got this to a certified passive house. Um, obviously, passive house is focused on on operational energy. We, we can also do all that. You, you do the the numbers and and the embodied carbon offsets all the all the all, all, all the upfront carbon. So it's a fantastic um, approach. And the, what we're doing here is try, is looking at how we mainstream passive house to to, to the wider audience. Just a few images of that. And just to kind of to close this a project um, for the for Grosvenor Estate down at, at uh, Chester. So we, during lockdown, actually, we, I happened to, to live on a small farm, small family farm, and we were able to work in our workshop during lockdown. And we, we, built, um, we built the 50 trusses that went into this. Grosvenor were very keen to use the spruce that they had in their own estate. So we got that contract milled. But up to Inverness, built all these parts and, and, and trucked them down to Chester and put it together. So just to kind of to kind of summarize, and we've hopefully got a few few minutes for questions still. So uh, we need more woodland expansion across the UK. I think we can all agree on, on on multiple benefits of that for climate action. You should specify C16, not C24. It's a simple kind of decision to make. Collaborate with your structural engineer. And the two of you go down to the local sawmill and, and find out what folk are doing there and respond to it. Um, we should be more ambitious about the, the timber that we have. Too much of it is, is, is regarded as, as not useful when it actually is. And, um, and, and also don't forget that this process is innovation, that we, it's, it's materials and processes together. And, and, and finally, yeah, let's just respond to what we have. Let's, let's, let's be grateful for what we have and, and, and see what we can do with it. Thanks very much for the opportunity. All the best. Thanks so much, Neil. And I'd like to invite all our speakers to turn on their microphones and we will head over to the chat. I do specifically like your, your roofs where you um, shed the water. No flat roofs in sight, which... Uh, uh, if anybody knows me, I guess, ah, not another flat roof you're going to, to put on a building. We do need to keep our timber 
in use for as long as it's grown and if at all possible in use for longer than that. So please pop your questions in the chat um, for as we carry on. And I'm going to come to Kath first. Um, how can we encourage more biodiverse forests? And how do you see construction and forestry working together to create a successful supply chain? OK, two parter. I mean, the dealing with the second part first, and because it picks up immediately off the back of the wonderful presentation Neil's just gone through for us. Um, and the, the most immediate thing that always comes to my mind when I think about those two spaces working together more hand in hand is, is like Neil said, bring your engineers to the yard, you know, get people aren't crossing over in spaces enough. And we need so much more of that. And ACAN is such a wonderful space that brings so many people. That's already, these seeds are already out there, but I don't know, people need the courage or I don't know what they need to get down there, but go down there, get involved. You know what you need and what you're talking about, but actually you could have a conversation with, with a timber producer that could absolutely skew that and spin that in another direction, but for all of the best reasons. So yeah, without... Um, just stealing Neil's answer I mean that's very much always it and it's it's an openness as well it's an openness to to be willing to design beyond what you're used to and what feels safe I don't know I have an issue with safety but not in yeah uh, <laughs> so yeah so I think in, in answering uh the second the second part of that and the first one was about uh, encouraging more biodiverse that is a tricky one. That is a tricky one. There's so many needs to balance when we think about, you know, the woodlands that we're growing and what we're what we need and what we want them for. And it has to suit everything. This human centric thing that we have, it's all for us is nonsense. We have to be able to balance the biodiversity and that space for products coming out of it, but as well as that for well-being. Um, for everything that is living that goes beyond us. So I don't have a simple answer for that. And it's going to be different in different spaces. It depends where you are. It's going to be so different in Scotland than it is to be muggly, misly climate I live in and everywhere in between. So, you know, yeah, it's a cop out, but <laughs> I'm going to leave it there. But that's the, the, the brilliance of forestry. You it's know, the it reality. Can yeah. Yeah. Um, Tom, you've got lots of questions coming on on um, obviously brimstone and, and thermal modification. Um, I'll just quick fire them at you. Um, does the thermally modified wood look different from um, unmodified thermal wood? <laughs> <laughs> that was a quick answer. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a, it's a dark chocolatey brown yeah you can have general. any color you want as long as it's a version of brown uh, but my understanding is it doesn't stay brown uh well if you use it internally it does um if you use it externally without a coating then it will weather down and go gray like any other timber will it actually does it a lot more quickly though and and tends to do it a bit more consistently than than other um natural species but yeah it still it still goes great yeah yeah so to me it's it silvers be silvers beautifully yeah. um so something to ask about the greater stability um how does it well i suppose how does it compare i was saying to other species but that's a no, good, name, good question yeah but. yeah good question we did some research recently actually with bath university and I, i've got all the data if anyone wants it but um i suppose if you wanted to put it in in context um, you know, one of the most stable species out there is cedar. Um, it's a bit more stable than that. Uh, it's not as stable as a coir, which is almost completely inert. Um, but certainly, um, yeah, more stable than any natural wood out there. Yeah. No, thanks for that. And let's just go out with a final one. What about the structural properties? Less. So yeah, what the, the the one downside of cooking wood to very um, high temperature is is that you you do burn away part of the cell wall, which is the hemicellulose bit, which is actually the important um, thing of doing when you're modifying wood because that's also the bit that water bonds onto. But in 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 sort of concrete terms, it acts like the cement, and so you're getting rid of some of the cement, uh, which does make the wood a bit more brittle. It, it actually, in reality, it hasn't turned out to be as much of a problem as I thought it was going to be. Um, providing you don't have really ham-fisted contractors on site. 
<laughs> so you can still use it as decking, yeah. um, which yeah, yeah, yeah. and and joinery. I mean, you wouldn't you wouldn't try and build the frame of a building out of it because there's far better things to use for that, and you're, you're not then you you're not utilising the benefits of it. The benefits are stability and durability, so it is best mm -hmm. used outside where you get maximum bang for your buck. And would you use it for um, joinery purposes? So for door frames, doors I, and I, windows? My windows? My windows and doors at home, on the back of the house, are made out of brimstone ash. Um, we, we haven't done as much with that as we'd like to have done, but we have various sort of test sites now set up around the country and quite a few joiners wanting to get involved. Um, haven't had time, is the honest answer. The, the other issue is that you can only really thermally modify the hardwoods up to 50 mil thick which means you again then got to start working with lamination, glue, lots of stuff I don't really understand. So we, we just need some time on it, really. Um, but certainly the, the distinct lack of a coir on the market has spurred a lot of people to ask that question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Tom. And on to Matt. So um, question for here. Are your systems, so all the different products that you've talked about, available for small architectural practices for small projects? <laughs> Yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, some of those collaborations and, uh, and small, small projects can offer real test bed to trial stuff. You know, often there's, there's, it's easier to get sort of license to innovate and to do that early application, application of the innovative sort of approaches. So, yes, absolutely. Um, a lot, a lot of the stuff which I've shown is actually, and, and interesting, a lot of the stuff that we've rolled out has been, you know, Department of Education scales, Scottish Power, all that stuff. But you know, if you if you look further back, you know, in our track record, you know, significant proportion has been through those those sort of smaller collaborative projects. Um, and yeah, there's there's uh, definitely lots lots of room for that. Brilliant, thanks, Matt. So people can just reach out, find you on wherever you are in the country, whichever roof you're up on, and it, give you a it. shout. <laughs> and we want to be as targeted as possible. You know, there's a limited capacity, so. We, we want to get the right projects out there that has some, have the maximum impact to move move the mission forward. So, yeah, uh, totally. Thanks. Well, thanks, Matt. And we can see lots more questions coming in, which you'll probably not get a chance to answer, but maybe we'll ask our speakers to try and answer them and get them back, I think, in the party bag. Um, Neil, um, how do you manage to find local engineers um, who can design with C16 timber? And how do you yeah, get them well, confident? Yeah, that's a good, good question, but um, it's a bit like Kath was saying, you know, um, it's part of our job to kind of um, become quite good at collaborating and also good at what we do. So there's there's only so many ways to build a small timber house, you know, and we've done them all. You know, we've built, you know, I don't know how many we've built, over 200 or something. So I think, you know, part of the problem with architects, <laughs> I'll say this as, you know, I originally trained as an engineer. <laughs> and I'm an architect, apparently. Yeah, I'm probably safe to say that in this company, but um, is that, you know, we, we have to get um, happy with elegance and refinement rather than newness all the time. You know, the timber lends itself to building it in specific timber ways. That's its expression. You know, so you tend to triangulate things. You tend to, to get things to kind of to, to work in certain ways. So it's our job as architects to actually understand some of these principles of engineering. And then we can actually work with engineers on a kind of level, kind of, and we can actually, it's kind of fun, you know, working with folk when, when you, you get to that kind of level of understanding. So, you know, I suppose what, what, what we've been doing is, is, is kind of building up that, that experience and then taking engineers with us. And we, you know, collaborative, truly collaborative way. And as Kath was, was saying, you know, we, we, we're longing for a, an ecological civilization where we, we embrace complexity. You know, complexity is, is, is where it's at, uh, but it's, it, that's different from being complex. You know, complexity is, is a joy in that sense. And, and so, so, you know, the, there's, there's influences from all over in that sense, you know. So from tradition, but also from, from newness, from, from technology, from digitization, we've embraced that too, you know. Uh, we've got to be open-minded in that sense. What a dreadful answer to your question, Tabitha. 
Not my question. It was from the chat. Um, I know we. <laughs> okay. I, I stopped myself asking any questions or getting too too carried away. As as you know, is my want. Um, I know we've run a little bit over time, and we're going to just take a like. Is, is there like one final word from each of you to how do we encourage sort of a better use of timber, knowing that it's a precious resource? Um, just like one final. Word. And I'll just go in the order that you you all spoke in. Catherine, anything to add? Oh, I mean, for me personally, and it's slightly off piste to everything we've maybe covered today, but it's something Tony you hit on very early on, and it and it's it takes so long to grow this precious, wonderful material that we can do so much with. The absolute least we can do with it is have that in use far beyond its service life, like way beyond. So, and if I think about timber availability in the UK, we're a tiny little space. Neil, you had numbers on, you know, us compared to Europe. We're never going to hit that. We're never going to be able to supply our own demand. So it's finding more creative and interesting ways. And it's it's keeping that timber in use for longer. That's That's my one thing for sure. Thank you, Catherine. And uh, Tom? Um, I would say two words, if I may. Um, lo local and varied. Um, and I think, just to expand on that a little bit, um, from an I guess from the perspective of an architect, try and consider that early on in the process. Um, what we do get a lot is where um, timber's been specced to a certain grade, a certain look, right? and then right in it's, well, can we, can we find that locally? To match that thing that was going to be imported well no and i think you know everyone's kind of you know especially neil has, has made the point understand what wood is available and then work around that design around that rather than trying to retrofit it at the end thanks tom really good points matt uh yeah i would say that you know let's get more people into into visiting the timber buildings that we're creating because you know that that's that settles the argument about uh, you know the the benefits of it that that biophilic benefit you know it's great when people visit and just the you know the smell the, the atmosphere you know everything else like that so if we can do that then we can then we can absolutely do as Catherine said and keep 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 it in the long life cycles as long as we can uh, thank you thanks Matt and Neil yeah we we live in the timber age uh, stage of timber and um, although we probably don't know it. And so, yeah, let's just live closer with timber in, in all its forms, you know, with, with forestry. Uh, let, let's, you know, physically and, and, and metaphorically get closer to timber. Uh, we, we have to embrace it. Let's get on with it. Thanks. So, thank you, Neil. And a huge thank you for all for doing what you do with timber and coming and speaking as, to us this evening. Um, Andy, can I hand back to you? Thank you everyone for coming. It's been an absolute pleasure. I'm just going to quickly wrap up now by letting you know that firstly, we'll be holding more natural material events with the next of our master classes on the 8th of December for a session focused on retrofit. Uh, ACAN is a voluntary organisation. If you would like to donate to fund events like this, we'll post a link in the chat now. Thank you.